Okay, here we go. Believe it or not, this watch is not restored. This is unrestored. It's never been serviced. There's barely any miles on it. Exquisitely rare piece. 6159-7019, not 7010, 7019. Uh, apparently, something like only 3% of the grandfather, grandfather tunas were the 7019s. And this one's entirely original. Never been serviced. Well, might as well do it. If we're going to do it, let's do it. Okay. It's amazing to me. So, I just pulled off the shroud, and this watch has never been apart. There's no dust inside the shroud. Normally, I open these up, and even if they look like they haven't been worn, there's going to be all kinds of dust and crap in here. Nothing. Nothing. The rotating ring seal is pretty stiff. I can feel that because I should be able to just pull this right out. That's going to be hard as nails. Screws are perfect. As sharp as anything. Perfect heads. Okay, onward. Yeah, oh, so the rotating ring, the rotating ring seal was gasket was all the thing. So this is underneath the rotating ring seal. I haven't cleaned anything. Isn't that amazing? Look at that. Just a little bit of dust. That's really astonishing. Really amazing. Uh, always an interesting detail. Someone wrote the number four on this. I wonder why. I wonder what it meant. Maybe it's not the number four. Maybe it's a character for something. So I got the crystal retaining ring out. Uh, it's something I noticed when I was doing it. If you look at the crystal retaining ring, normally when I pull any of these screw down things, you see these, the sides here on this, on each of these things will be all sort of pushed up and dented and hacked up from people pulling it. Square and clean. Not only that, you look underneath it. See this lighter ring here? That's the, uh, that is the nylon gasket that sits in here to, protect the crystal from the screw down ring. It's not even dirty. Wild. Oh, one thing. So where a lot of people get in trouble with these, I don't normally share my tips just because I don't think of it, but this is one of these deals where you have an original watch, original crystal. It's been sitting inside this L gasket for a very long time. These crystals don't want to come out. A lot of times what I use to pull these kinds of crystals is uh, I have a suction cup. Uh, and so I have a little suction cup with a thing and I pull up, it's not moving here. And so what people will do, they'll get in trouble. They'll try to get in, you know, they'll try to work, you know, with a screwdriver or something like this to, in the gap to kind of pry it up. And boy, you can get into all kinds of problems because you'd be amazed. You're putting force in there and you're leaning back and you're also forcing down and all of a sudden this thing will come up and you'll go blink and you'll scratch across the dial. And uh, it's just nothing, nothing, nothing you ever want to mess with. So what I do with these is you want to basically something that's not going to gouge or dig or anything. Notice I'm dragging. Is you basically run it between the edge of the crystal and the seal. You want to break that seal a little bit to, to sort of free it up so you can try to pull that crystal. It doesn't always work. Doesn't look like it's looks like I'm gonna have to get more fancy here anyway, but that's the system I'm gonna use. I'm just gonna get a little bit more forceful with it, and then that's gonna that is gonna want to pull out. Yep, okay. Well, let me get in there where I can really look at it, but that's the system I'm gonna use. I'm gonna basically do that again and again till I can kind of get this to move. I'm not gonna do anything that would threaten the dial of the hands. And there we are, about 30 seconds later. I went around it one more time, a little bit more force to get down in there in the in the suction cup, a little plastic suction cup, and, boop, and out it came. No danger to the dial, or to the crystal, or the seal, or anything. Just everything's cool. Everything is cool. So there we are. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? The real deal, baby. Okay, onward and upward. Okay, got the movement uncased. Uh, and there it is. Looking pretty beautiful. Looking pretty neat. You can see the care that they put into these movements. Here's your 6159B. 
And you can see how clean it is. Look at how clean it is. I don't know why it has a scratch there. They must have done that when they were assembling it. Interesting. Look at that. And this watch has never been apart. So when they were assembling this watch, someone's screwdriver slipped. Tisk, 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 someone in Japan. Nice. That's the bunny. Uh, interestingly, so the date on this on this watch is uh, it's six four, so April seventy six, and we always want the dials to be the same month or maybe uh, the month before. Sometimes though, we are going to see them a couple months before. It's not unusual. It's just it's always nice to see six two. There's that beautiful dial. Especially the detail there of the how the the silver sua symbol wraps around that dial marker. Isn't that beautiful? Really nice, and you can see the you can see the sort of the the, the hatchy linen pattern of the dial loom. I don't know why these sixty one fifty nines had tan dial loom. I don't know why in seventy six and seventy seven a lot of Sua's diver production went like this, but they did. Possible to replicate, impossible to replicate. Between the color, the grain, and the and the printing pattern, can't be done. Can't be done. Wow. Okay. One thing I noticed that's fun. Uh, in other cases, like say a sixty three oh nine case, you can't really see how the crown tube is put in there. Uh, the theory is that it's electrically welded in, like they put this in and they run a charge through it. Uh, this one, you'll notice, is bronze, bronze soldered in. Maybe that's patinaed silver. Maybe it's silver solder. But you can see how the, how the solder ran in. In fact, there's a blob of it, blob of solder right here. You can see something. I mean, someone basically they put this in and then they, they ran in, they ran in the flux. You can see it there. See how that got put together? And interesting too, because look, they they cranked out they're supposed to, there's this gap is supposed to be on the bottom. They actually cranked it over a little bit. This thing, this gap is a little bit further down. Like this whole thing is twisted over a little bit. Very interesting. All that solder. Pretty neat. So uh, I did the first step. I pulled off the winding bridge and I'm just, uh, winding weight rather, oscillating weight, and I'm just looking at this. So the 6159 is a modified 6000 series watch, the base caliber of which is the 6106 25 Joule. And this is the same basic thing. I mean, it's the same sizes, it's the same basic stuff. The, a lot of the things are the same. Like this movement will drop right into any 6000 series case. Like I could put this in a 6309 dive case. Easy. I mean the stem, the inner stem part, like this whole collapsible stem bit is exactly the same as the one in the 6309. Differences being the number of teeth on the wheels, uh, the diameter of the, of the balance, how the, how the, the, the balance cock is set up. That's different. Uh, uh, just crap like that. Okay. Uh, it's running with amplitudes in like the 180s, 190s right now. So, but interestingly, it still shows old lubricant in that capsule right there. Original Japanese stuff, but it's not doing its job anymore. Okay, I've got the winding bridge off and disassembled, and you can see the jewels and how this thing is set up. Now, at this point, you can see how they achieve the hand winding, which is an extremely standard way to do it. Um, here is a Tizo dress watch from the 70s. And if you look at this Swiss movement, you can see that it's more or less set up the same. You can see the, the jewels, you can see the way that it winds. I mean, the balance cock goes the different direction, but other than that, it's the same tech, same basic stuff. All watches are watches for a given value of a watch. Okay, let me put this thing back together. 
And let's move on. I have this thing powered down. Notice again how clean it is. I mean, how few miles this thing has. Nothing going on. Very, very simple. Okay, okay. Just about to pull the train bridge, but it's so interesting to see. Again, this watch has never been serviced. Look, for those of you who've seen my videos before, you used to me pulling off the like this wheel, ratchet wheel here, and just seeing how filthy it is underneath. Look at that. Looks like it just came out of the cleaner. Perfect. You can also see the nice jewel here in all other Seikos that aren't a 6159 or 6146 or 6145, whatever. Uh, this is going to be a metal bushing, and this is the jewel that's in there. This wheel here, this crown wheel, is uh, permanently fixed on this, uh, so we're not going to worry about taking that off. Okay, well, there we go. Look, see, there's a little bit of that, that gruck from the main spring barrel. A little bit of it. I'm gonna put that there. Okay, so here we get into something that's actually pretty, pretty specific for these. Normally, escape wheel and all this stuff are gonna go into the cleaner, but these pieces, hang on just one second, I'm trying to see this and do the same time. One of the things that's peculiar about this is you, these parts, these two parts, the pallet fork and the escape wheel, which is right here, they do not go through the cleaner because they have coatings on them to make sure that the lubrication stays put. You're supposed to rinse them in benzene, which is basically basically like lighter fluid, uh, gasoline or whatever, but lighter fluid, a, very, a fine dis petroleum distillate, and then you let them air dry. These other ones, that's fine. You can go through and deal with it and it's everything's hunky-dory, but those two, no, you don't do it. And a lot of people get in trouble for that. So let me disassemble this, and then we can do the next fun thing. Here's, uh, here's the key, wait, where are we? Aha. Uh -huh. Here's the key right here. So there's your escape wheel. See all those, all that multitude of teeth on there? That's for the high beat. Because everything is more finely geared. The ratios, the number ratios are different, so you split up the the BPH split up that time it takes to complete an hour. More teeth, more division. And there it is, all its glory. So that is gonna go in here. Now, here's the fun part. Here's the mainspring barrel. In order to push this gear train, push it hard to make it run that high beat, you have not only jewels top and bottom on the mainspring, but you also have a high tension mainspring itself inside the barrel. It says, do not open. These are in theory permanently closed. So, but, and so for a long time when one would service these, it says do not open. You, and you were supposed to basically replace the entire mainspring barrel. But obviously, as with everything else, vintage Seiko, that can't be done because the spare parts simply don't exist. So people would have to sort of make do and you'd have to deal with the fact that these have old lubrication in them and are super gross. Come on, come on, upsy daisy. Come on. Upsy, there we go. There's that. There's that, your center wheel cock. So now, and so for a long time, I never tried to open these. I'd clean them on the outside and I would uh, lubricate them best as I could. Let's move this to one side, go over there. And so I, and, and there was a, there's a, I have a colleague in the UK who came up, he said with some proprietary system to open these permanently sealed barrels. You couldn't open them up. And if you did, you had to sort of work to turn them again. Well, here's the secret. Now, normally one of these barrels this is the side that pops open. You put you put pressure down on each side of the on the on the on the gears there, and the, this whole top cap comes off. Well, on the do not open ones, you open this side like a Bellmatic, not like a six thousand series at all. So let's try this. Get this on a hard surface. Sorry, you're just going to have to hear my voice. Uh, hang on, just one second. And so. He talked about how hard it was to get these open. I just did what I normally do, except I did it from the other side. And it pops right open. 
there it is. All that worrying time. I mean, I remember sending mainspring barrels to him to open up and close for me. And then when I, I had done a Bellmatic and I was like, I was looking very closely at one of these and I'm like, I see the seam there. I see the seam. I wonder if it pops on this side. And I had found, I'd bought like four or five new old stock ones. And I said, like, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to try it. And sure enough, it opened up. And ever since then, I've always kind of chuckled a little bit. You know, the stuff is, you know, black, black, supposedly, you know, deeply held secrets, crap like that. But nope, no deeply held secrets, nothing special. It's just a mainspring barrel with a mainspring inside of it. And there it is. You can see that's why we want to rebuild these because there's that old S2 lubricant that's still inside there. We want to pull that and we want to get that clean. And that's it. So that's the secret. There's the secret. It doesn't open this side like a normal 6000 series. It opens this side. And then it's perfectly fine. Okay. I'm going to get deep into the nuts and bolts now. Uh, so I'm probably not going to... You're probably going to see a video of me uh, when we're out of the cleaning process. You can see the lower mainspring arbor jewel here. And the rest of this stuff. Before I really get down to it. And it's so nice. I mean, why didn't Seiko do this? We have, with jewels top and bottom... All of the 6000 series, yeah, they would have spent a little bit more per watch, but man, they would have lasted forever. Why didn't they do it? Eh, it just breaks my heart. Okay, so uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, now I'm getting into the real meat and potatoes of it, so I'm going to, I'm going to, you'll, we'll, we'll revisit on the other side. Okay, I lied. Uh, I just thought it'd be interesting to show, look, look at all the S2 lubricant that Seiko put in there. Wait, what's that? Oh God, it's, look at that, it's just like a, a chunk of like, that's like a chunk of hardened S2 lubricant there. But look at that. Look at how much Seiko blorged in there. Tons of the stuff. You can see it there as well. Uh, the mainspring is different. I mean, I can see it. Let me back this up here. The key difference is, is that it's, uh, it's slightly longer. It's thicker. But the big deal, for me anyway, and I could be wrong, is that the bridle structure is different. This is the bridle. This from a slipping mainspring, what this does, this grips the inside wall of the mainspring barrel. And this bridle is much stiffer, much heavier duty than a standard 6000 series bridle. Standard 6000 bridle is going to be the same thickness material as this. This is easily twice the thickness. And it's a much harder curve. And what that does is it grips the wall of the mainspring barrel and makes sure that it, it's delivering all that push, as much push as possible, down to run power through the train. And there that is. So that's what that's the deal. I just did a quick hand cleaning on the on this barrel here. Cut all that stuff out. Look, the inside of the barrel looks brand new. I don't think the guy wore this watch more than a couple times. Honestly, I really don't. That's amazing. You never see that. Normally you'll see some brass banding and wear on the inside, but not here. Amazing. Okay. Okay, everything's out of the cleaner. Interesting, interesting thing. This watch has almost no miles on it, right? But what do we see? I've got an X-Acto knife here, don't mind me. Look at the center wheel jewel. See those lines across it, lines through it? The center wheel jewel is shattered. I wonder how that happened. That's obviously no good, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a replacement and we're gonna replace that. Shattered center wheel jewel, how crazy. Okay, let's get that done. Okay, and that is now accomplished. So here is the old center wheel jewel. Right there. I'm surprised it didn't come to pieces, honestly. It was so cracked and shattered, but there we are. And here, whoops, damn it. Okay, here is the old center wheel jewel. Frankly, I'm surprised it didn't shatter coming out, but it held together. Pretty wacky. Do you uh, have to be carefuler? That's, hi everybody, I'm just standing here and I'm just asking a question. Do you have to be more careful when it's gonna break or do you just jam it out or what? Well, if it's if the, if the jewel is shattered like this one is, then I mean, it, it comes out however it comes out. I just, 
I put plastic underneath it when I use the, the Zeitz jeweling tool to make sure I don't have jewel shards everywhere, but this one came out in one piece. It's just interesting that between, I mean, this is a watch that was never opened. It's a 6159 watch that was never opened. It was basically brand new. The inside of the mainspring barrel looked perfect. It was like mirror finish, had no miles on it, but it had a scratch on it. When somebody was putting on the, um, the, the oscillating, the winding bridge, there was a somebody there's screwdriver slipped and there was actually a scratch on it from the factory and this jewel was shattered so you know it's what they used to say is it got built on a monday or a friday <laughs> when somebody was thinking about getting off work and getting their cure and beer or whatever the heck it is but anyway there is the new jewel in place and uh, so we are going to keep forging ahead bad jewel bad <laughs> okay bye bye Okay, so I'm at the end of a work day. It is quitting time. I just dropped on the balance. I had to go back in and adjust the, the shake and all kinds of stuff on, on these things. The, this, this, this one was actually was binding up because it was too tight. So I had, to, uh, I had to work on that and get these to move. These diafix settings, especially in the, in the can be they're they're like a, a unit they're like a cartridge and they can be they can be gently moved up and down using the Zeitz jeweling tool but uh, so far it is running I'm gonna let it run in overnight and then we'll see how things are going tomorrow uh, I don't have the calendar loaded on this is just it's the bare main plate with all this stuff train and all that stuff just to let it run in get everything where it's supposed to go and then uh, we'll revisit tomorrow and see how we're doing but right now as we see, it is running. Okay, tomorrow morning. Well, good morning. So far, so good. Got steady output. This is about 12 hours down. When I first turned the machine on, it was at 243, so we're getting a little bit of variance, but it's, it's normal. And there we are. The only, I mean, it'd be nice if you, know, you had that sort of dramatic transformation of the old watch to the, to the way it looks you know, now and all that other kind of stuff, but it looked really, really, really good to begin with, and so it looks really, really, really good now. I mean, it's cleaner, obviously. It's all greased up, and the seals are correct, and serviced, and all that kind of stuff, and the broken jewel is replaced. And that screws down all the way, as it should. Look at that, do you see all those turns? Really is something. Really is something. I'll never see one that, like this again. Probably the only one of that I'll ever see. Uh, here is the original strap for it. Uh, I had taken it off, uh, but you could certainly put it back on uh, with it. But it's in good condition. I mean, it's. I mean, it's a little stiff, but it's it's flexible enough with its titanium buckle. I don't know, there's, there's not really much else to say. What a great watch. I'll never see another one like this. I can't imagine how I would. Can't imagine how I would. What a watch. What a watch. Okay, well, thank you so much.